The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. Here we go. So the story is like this. There was once a girl whose name was, pick a name, Rivka. Rivka, okay. So there's not all those Rivkas, I apologize. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rivka. There's a name of Rivka, and she was 19 years old, and she was a Kala, due to be married in several weeks. Preparations were almost complete, and the family was full of joy, anticipation. There's no shit of crisis with her. Baruch Hashem, we found a guy. Ah, everything is like, shh, unbelievable. Then one morning, we're getting closer and closer to the wedding, and Rivka doesn't wake up. She just doesn't wake up. She was died in her bed, in her sleep. The tragedy was sudden and was unfathomable. Like, what What just happened? Like, what? No, this doesn't happen. What does that mean? And everything, everybody was broken and the grief was overwhelming and the parents just could not understand. What was the plan here? What was the story? Forget about the chassan, forget about the siblings, the cousins, the aunts, everybody. Like, what happened over here? And usually we're not privileged to know HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan. But in this story, we are privileged to know. They were privileged to know. So the story goes like this. Four years later, four years later, Rivka's 12-year-old sister, who had been only eight years old at the time of her passing, woke up in the middle of the night, trembling, scared, shaking violently. And in her dream, she had seen Rivka. And she took her by the hand and she led her into a dense forest in the dream where they sat down by, by uh, you know, side by side by some bench, a random bench in the forest. And Rivka turned to her younger sister with imploring eyes. And she said, please, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to tell Abba and Ima to try to overcome their grief. It's already four years, and they were still broken. The whole family was broken. And I need them to overcome their grief. I need you to tell them that I am very very happy where I am. She then began to share the journey that her neshama traversed over all the, 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 the whole globe and the whole century and the whole era and geographically and the time. She started showing her a, whole, a much bigger picture than we see. We see somebody's born, somebody gets married, somebody lives, grandchildren, somebody dies. They had one life. It was this century. Geographically, it was over here. That's it. She said, there's much more to my story. I wasn't just a 19-year-old girl who died in your family. It really goes much deeper. Come with me on a journey. And she takes her on a journey to Hungary in 1944. The Nazi juggernaut was storming across Europe, leaving death and destruction in its wake, in its path, wherever millions and millions had already been sent to their deaths and millions more were going to perish. This is not only in the Holocaust itself of the Jews, also across the whole globe. There were millions and millions of people that were killed. I was then an infant. This is Rivka telling her sister from a previous life. I was an infant just a few months old with golden blonde hair, blue eyes, and just a beautiful expression. Painfully aware of the tragic fate that awaited them, yet still hopeful that things would not be as bad as what it seemed, my parents entrusted me to the care of their Goyesha neighbors, their Gentile neighbors, in exchange for my mother's jewelry. If I, take, if I give you my jewelry, you'll take my child, this beautiful girl, and you will take care of her. And they begged, and they begged, please watch over them till we return to reclaim. Like the vast majority of Hungarian Jews, my parents never returned. And by then, my uh, foster parents had grown to love me as their own child. And they didn't want to part with me. And they didn't want to find a Jewish family to return me to. So they raised me devotedly, they always had. A, it was. A, I always felt like there was an identity of me missing. But they were such loving parents that again, I never searched even more. Whatever the case was. Anyways, when I turned 19 years old, I discovered the truth. I discovered that I was a pure-blooded Hungarian who was a Jew, and I always knew this. Somehow, I always knew this, even though I was taken as an infant. I always knew this. They're still sitting on the bench in the forest in the dream. I felt an urge to discover more about my heritage, and one day I said goodbye to the life that I had known until that point and rejoined my family. In other words, my family, meaning the Jews. I was taken in by a wonderful Jewish family who taught me the meaning of Torah and Mitzvah, and for the first time in my life, I felt whole. I felt was like life was had meaning to it. There was something here. 
A few years later, I was married to a young survivor who ultimately became a great Torah scholar. We moved to Eretz Yisrael and we built a beautiful family. When my time came, I ascended to the Bezdin Shalmaila. Now this was, obviously, after living a full life of meaning in Torah. And I was treated to a very unpleasant surprise. It was agreed that since I had lived a life from the age of 19 and on as a devoted Jew and did everything right, I was going to enter Gan Eden. I did so many good things in my life, so many mitzvahs, the candles and challah, taking care of my children, taking care of my husband, Torah, supporting Torah. But because I spent the first 19 years of my life in the family of a guy behaving just like them, I would not be permitted to enter Gan Eden until my soul was purified. And they presented me with two options. Either I would undergo some very painful purification process in Shemayim. That was one. But they said it was painful. The second was to return into the lower world and relive those 19 years of emptiness and tumma as a God-fearing Jew. And I could do that, but I will be taken at the, I will be taken at the age of 19. I chose the second alternative and I was there reborn to my parents in Tifrach where I lived and matured for 19 years. On the night that I completed my quota of years, I closed my eyes, never to reawaken. But now, I am rejoicing in Gan Eden, in a world that is indescribably good and beautiful and joyous and I can't even explain to you what it's like. Though she was shaken by her dream, Rivka's youngest, and then she woke up, shaking, scared. Pachar, was this fake? Was this real? This, this can't be real. This, this is not real. This is just a dream. Like, these things don't happen. Is there even a next life? Like, like this is not real. Rivka's younger sister told nobody what she experienced because even though part of her believed it was true because it was so real and it was, it was just real. But the other thought that it was like a foolish dream, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything, so she remained silent. The following night, Rivka appeared again and then again and then again. And every night, in one of the dreams, maybe the third dream, the fourth dream, whatever it was, her sister took her by the hand and he said, Dear sister, everything that I am telling you is true. This is not a, uh, a fake dream. This is real. And I ask you again to please, I need you to tell Abba and Ima, it hurts my soul, it hurts my neshama. I need you to tell them to stop grieving for me. I'm in a very, very good place. I will even give you a sign so that you'll believe me. You are too young to remember this, but if you check and discover that you'll, if you'll check and you'll see that it's true, then you'll know that for sure that I'm speaking the truth, because otherwise I couldn't have known this. So here we go. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to find this out. And if it's true, then you need to tell everybody else the rest of the dream. After my Shiva, Abba traveled to Yushalayim, where I was buried and recited Pirkei Tehillim at my grave. I just want to tell you that the tefillahs by my kever, by my grave, have it was elevating. It was so the feelings of my neshama when they said Tehillim by my kever, and it brought me such a nachas ruach and shemaim. It was unbelievable. But then, when the shleshim ended, Abba, he debated long and hard whether or not to make the long journey to Yushalayim, which will be many hours of Bittal Taira. But I want to say to him about my daughter's grave, my poor daughter, 19 years old, supposed to get married. But I, I, it's Bittal Taira because I'm learning. So what should I do? This time he decided that Limud HaTaira uh, takes priority. And he dedicated the hours of learning Taira as an aliyah for my neshama instead of going to my kever. Now, on the one hand, it would have been very good for me if Abba had davened at my kever, because there is something very unique about that. But the sacrifice that he made in order to continue learning gave me such an incredible nachas and shemayim. And it was even more, it was even more, the learning Torah that he did for my, for my neshama was even more than when he had come and uh, it took priority. Then when he even came, it was just like, it was an unbelievable thing. I wasn't really sure, but it just the feeling was, I couldn't, uh, it was just, I can't describe it, what the feeling is. It's just unbelievable. More than the kever, meaning more than the tilum visit by the kever. Then the dream ended. Rivka's sister woke up, and this time she was convinced that she had to do something, because it was already a few nights in a row. So she went to her father, and her father said, how do you know that? How do you know that that was my husband? How do you... Like she said, is it true that you... She's like, how do you know this? Nobody knew. That was something that I personally had in my head. I wanted to go and I was... I felt so bad that I didn't end up going. How do you know this? And she said the entire story. She said the entire... And both Abba and Ima... 
derived a great amount of comfort from the story. Four years later, the pain, the anguish. But I understand that there was a whole, there was a bigger plan here. 19 years, Nazi Germany, hungry, raised by somebody who wasn't Jewish, and she had to come back, and this was the decision that this neshama chose. But it was real. This was real. And that was real. It is real. Sometimes we don't see the Gilgulim. <laughs> we don't see the whole picture. We don't know what, when, where, how. We don't know anything. Our world is overflowing with trials and tribulations, pain and suffering, that is rarely understood by our human minds. Like after all, once we get to 4 plus 4, it starts getting hard. You know, 8 plus 8, 20 by the it starts getting hard. So what are we going to know? And there are very few times that we are privileged at a little bit, a glimpse a fraction of a master plan, because over here, now we under, we sort of understand her chashbin, but we don't understand the pain of the siblings, the pain of the parents, the pain of the chasen, the chasen's family, so this is a huge picture, but we're privileged to a little bit. We understand that this is something that she had to do. So why did she have to get married? Why did she have to get engaged? Just leave a 19... Many pl- We don't know. Our mere human minds, I would say. But we see that there's a little bit of a plan, and she, she came back. She came back in the dream of her sister. This is real. This is a real story. But there are moments in our lives, just like as in the story, that he offers us a rear peek into his magical workings and demonstrating that even some of these things, there's purpose, there's purpose, and there's meaning, and there's love. And sometimes it's hard to see. And sometimes we do want to be privileged to more. And if you want to be privileged to more, then maybe open your eyes wider and just look at your human body. And look at the different things that we are able to see every day that sometimes we just shut out because it's just whatever, it's natural, whatever. A lot of times we go through hard things and we just, we believe that nobody exists, nobody loves us anymore. I get this email quite often, nobody in the world loves me. Nobody. If I only had one person that I wouldn't want to do this, I wouldn't want this, I wouldn't want Nobody, Hashem loves you. Now we need more than that, obviously, we're humans. But I'm just bringing out a point that we have to realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does love us, even though there's so many things that seem so dark. And we're not always privileged to see. But at least, at least we know. And more than knowing, if you open your eyes a little bit, you'll see it. That even, we said this before, I remember we said this, I think it was even a dose. That even in the tunnel itself, there are lights. Forget about the light at the end, there are lights in the tunnel. If you open your eyes and you see how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu really does love you and how much the plan is so perfect for you. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.